obviously the, the bigger the knob and the smaller the paddock, the quicker response you get. We had uh, around 1,500 to 2,000 head of cattle uh, in one mob, moving them every second or third day. Um, so it would take approximately uh, three to four months to do a full a full circle of all the, of all those paddocks. Uh, my wife Sue did most of the moving, and she enjoyed doing it. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Like like a lot of people would think, oh, bugger that, you know. Like no way in the world I'm going to ever do anything like that, you know. And um, and, and you don't have to be in that that intense. Um, the main thing is to sort of, you know, match stocking weight with carrying capacity so people don't run in more stock than they've got grass to feed them on, you know, over a 12 month period, this kind of thing. We bought this property in 2010 and since then, so, you know, 13 years ago, uh, we've spent nine long years in drought and during those years we got to a point where we actually had to fully destock and before the drought, we were 100% beef cattle. We had set stocking rates. We were doing things that we'd just always done. And then the drought comes along, you have to sell all your stock and you start to wonder, well, how can you make the landscape more resilient? How can you work with the country? So here at Salton Creek, we run a red meat production business, so meat, sheep, goats and cattle are part of our mix and we've done that so that we can basically run an adaptive multi-paddock operation using holistic management strategies and the importance of that for us is being really aware of our ecosystems that we have here on property, uh, trying to basically regenerate our landscapes, making them more resilient to the impacts of climate change. We're currently standing on part of Mithy country and our family's been around the area, oh well, for as long as I can remember and traditionally for the last at least 60,000 years. We've managed the country over the years on different properties and stuff, um, as well as worked on most of the properties in the area. This is probably one of the better um, managed places sort of around the area that, that I'm sort of aware of in my travels. Um, livestock gets moved around so paddocks get rested. Like everything you see in the background is edible. There's, there's not much out here that livestock won't eat because without the country and without letting it have its spells and, and times when there's times when you have to hammer it a bit harder, put a few extra stock there to give it a bit of a touch up, but then you got to give it that good spell to recover again. Um, so it doesn't, so the country doesn't get sour, I suppose. Um, like in the Northern Territory, you burn every year before the wet season, you burn straight after the wet season and that gets rid of all the old grasses and stuff, whereas I think a lot of the pastoral houses down this way now are gone away from fires and, and um, are using livestock sort of as a fire tool. There is still parts of the country that I, I swear it does need burning. Um, spin effects country and stuff like that where cattle won't eat a lot of the spin effects. We've got yeah, basically two and a half thousand head of cattle. Now, uh, a, a, a good yeah, sort of contact and mentor of, of mine in my younger years, Chris Hengler um, from the Kimberley in WA, talks about cattle having five mouths. Um, now, it's a bit confusing, but generally we've got, you know, one of those feeds the animal and the other four are feeding the soil. Um, and so that's in their, you know, their hoof interaction with the soil, um, you know, pushing those, uh, that dry grass and that, not just onto the soil, but sort of into it. It lets the soil biology, you know, interact with that then, break it down a lot quicker. And so they are, they're a, you know, they're a really brilliant and highly effective tool for our ecology. Yeah. By having the opportunity to, 
we put a lot of stock into those particular paddocks that were severely degraded during a uh, rain event and then they would uh, literally plough the paddock up uh, and then spell it for a period of two to three months uh, and let, let the country uh, come back to life, so to speak. Yeah, if, we, if we knew rain was coming, we'd, we'd move the cattle to the most degraded paddocks and put them in there. And then ideally, uh, if the rain went on for a period of time, you'd move them into another degraded paddock. Well, they, they'd just walk back before they'd plough the whole paddock up. And, and the beauty of that is that you get much better rain infiltration when they, and we call it herd effect, because the hooves are sort of breaking up the, and then uh, you get much better rain infiltration, so the response, <clears throat> you know, the effectiveness of the rainfall is dramatically better. There's no runoff. Well, I guess I'm just always interested in learning things. I'm not, I'm not afraid to do things differently or whatever, or just to try something new. Um, so, and I guess cell grazing's been around for a long, long time and there's been lots of studies. There's only four paddocks on Lara, that's 15,000 acres and it's not cell grazing, it's not, I don't know probably how the textbook tells you to do it, but I just thought, well, I'll try. Yeah. Just, just have a go. The cattle came out of here in um, sort of November. Um, they'd been in here since uh, May, so what was that, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, yeah, so it had six months grazing um, and the whole herd was in here. Um, I really wanted to um, eat it down, get an even graze over everything. The buffalo can get pretty thick down in the river channels. And so I was trying to get a nice, good, even graze and then move them out. Um, just whenever I thought that needed to happen, it didn't, you know, if it was September, October, but we did get a bit of rain and then um, I like to have them calving a bit closer, so I moved them out. It had been pretty well eaten down. Here definitely is pretty heavily grazed, so this was um, probably about, you know, chewed down buffalo um, in November and yeah, it's just come back really well here. Where I'm standing, I'm not far from the watering point and it's a fairly popular watering point here. Um, and I do have a photo beginning of January and like I said, the grass is this high and now you can barely see the road to drive through it. I actually was looking for a lick tub in there and really couldn't find it. I had to stand on the top the roof of the Toyota to see where it was. Um, so it's just come back uh, probably in the water square itself, it is just that thick and lush, just over the whole area. Whereas out here, there's it ebbs and flows a little bit thicker areas and thinner areas. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure why that is, but I'm glad it happened. So. So I suppose what we've got at work here, yeah, there's the large water cycle and the small water cycle. So the small is managing the raindrop, the large is, you know, when we've got these channels and things that, that are running across the landscape, if we can, you know, there's two options, well there's a few options, but you know, the two main ones in our toolbox are mechanical intervention where we can either put, um, you know, bun walls to slow or you know, push timber and scrub into it to sort of, to, you know, to have a bit of a filtration effect. So they're great tools to use, but the other one we've also got is livestock. So being able to manage them to a degree where we're keeping really good ground cover, we're maintaining that all the time and, and keeping a sort of a, a coverage density of that ground cover that's able to stabilise and filtrate, um, you know, any water that's running across our landscape. Yeah, it gives us the benefit of, you know, keeping the nutrients, keeping the silt, keeping the you know, anything that's flowing down through that water there, as well as, you know, holding and stabilising, yeah, the, the topsoil itself. It's great to see with our multi-paddock rotations and our grazing system happening, we've got a really good variety of different grasses coming back and coming through. The grazing system we've got in place has seen the animal impact actually have a really positive result in terms of the biodiversity of perennials and the native grasses that we've got growing here. Certainly 
in, in these drier areas, these arid areas, the rainfall, making the most of our rainfall is, is pretty critical. And there's lots of ways that we can, we can do that. It's, it's making the most of our pasture, understanding how pasture grows, understanding how, our, you know, whether the, the management that we're, we're, we're using with our, with our livestock, whether that's improving the landscape or whether it's detracting from it. You know, if we, it's that fine line of, you know, if we're taking too much out with the grazing, we're, we're to the point where we're basically mining nutrients out of that, that ecosystem. Whereas when we get that balance right, we can use livestock to improve the productivity, improve the, um, the fertility of the landscape. And suddenly agriculture is actually in, is benefiting the landscape and that's how it should be.